Recently, dog shelters here in the Bay Area have been putting out the red alert that they are completely overwhelmed with good boys and good girls that need homes. I do not want a second dog necessarily, but I do have a house with a big fenced in yard and I wanted to help. So I signed up to be a foster. Within days, I got a call to come pick up my new temporary dog, Bug. Bug is a nine month old mutt or mixed breed dog. However, she has almond eyes, a velvety coat, a strong neck and jowls, a tapered tail. So the popular perception is that she is a pit bull, a type of dog that isn't really a recognized breed so much as it is a collection of breeds that share those physical traits. Um, the breeds include American Pit Bull Terriers, American Staffordshire Terriers, American Bullies, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, and others. And because she has those physical traits, there are some cities and towns and thousands of apartment buildings where she is not even allowed to live. Those traits also mean that when I first posted a cute photo of her on Twitter, I was almost immediately hit with this completely unhinged reply from a stranger. New York has kept record of every reported dog bite since 2015. Pit bulls were massively overrepresented. Wow, thanks Milo Thatch from Wish. What a helpful response. <laughs> I blocked him and forgot about it because I wasn't interested in getting into a nature versus nurture fight with an anti-pit bull activist because... I mean, obviously, they're weird, obsessive, and have already made up their minds based on an overly simplistic understanding of genetics. It would be like me seeing someone post a picture of a horse and then jumping into their timeline talking about how a horse killed Christopher Reeve once. But in the end, I decided to talk about it today because of a new study that I've seen pop up in various places that specifically looked into the genetic basis for the behavior of dogs. I first saw it when someone posted it in my Discord. Um, they sent along this summary uh, of the study in Ars Technica, headlined, Genetics Goes to the Dogs, Finds There's Not Much to Breed Behavior. And later, I saw the New York Times also picked it up and titled their piece, They're All Good Dogs and It Has Nothing to Do with Their Breed. So I read both of these and then I read the study. As usual, I'm going to put the facts as I understand them up front. Those headlines, especially the New York Times, are a bit misleading, as headlines often are. The actual study did find that some aspects of a dog's behavior can have some basis in their genetics, and those genetics can sometimes correspond to a breed's stereotypes. But the vast majority of their behavior, the study found, is due to other factors, like how they're raised. The authors conclude that breed offers only modest value for predicting the behavior of individual dogs. That's just the TLDR, though, so let's get into the actual study, which uh, is really interesting and well done. I loved reading this study. Ancestry Inclusive Dog Genomics Challenges Popular Breed Stereotypes was published last month in the journal Science and is available in full to read online. If you're interested, link is in the transcript linked below. One of my favorite aspects of the study is that it relies upon a citizen science initiative. Darwin's Ark is a huge open source project that enlists pet owners to aid in scientific research on dogs, ticks, and soon cats. It's run in part by Eleanor K. Carlson, Director of Vertebrate Genomics at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, along with a bunch of veterinarians, computational biologists, and scientists like Kathleen Morell, who led this study. It's super cool, and I'm so glad that this study tipped me off to its existence because as of now, Indy is officially a citizen scientist. His DNA kit is on the way. This study took the data from more than 18,000 dogs in the Darwin's Ark database, about half of which were purebred, uh, and included about 2,000 mutts who had their DNA sequenced. They then had the dog's humans fill out 12 short and easy surveys about their dog's behavior. Self-reported data is always going to be tricky and a little unreliable, and the authors acknowledge that. Some owners might be more likely to notice behavior that is in line with what breed they think their dog is and how that breed's supposed to act, or they might see their dog's behavior in a rosier light compared to a more objective observer. 
For instance, the owners of purebred golden retrievers were more likely to say that their dogs are friendly to strangers, while the owners of mutts, who unknowingly had golden retriever genes, weren't. But unfortunately, owner surveys are the best and most accurate tool available as the only other option would be having researchers personally observe 18,000 dogs for an extended period of time under a wide variety of conditions. You know, we we got to work with what we've got, right? When they examined this data, they found that about 9% of a dog's behaviors seem to be tied to their genetics. Some behaviors are more heritable than others. Bitability, which is the readiness to listen to and obey commands, is very heritable. And so purebred dogs with bitability as part of their breed standard were more likely to demonstrate that behavior. On the other hand, agonistic threshold, which is how easily a dog can be provoked or freaked out, is not very heritable, uh, so breed doesn't really tell us much about it. Fun fact, the strongest association between a specific behavior and a specific gene was getting stuck behind objects and gene SNX29, which they point out is associated with cognitive performance in human genome studies. They also found a significant association between howling and, as they write, an intergenic region between SLC3A11 and SCN3A, a voltage-gated sodium channel involved in the development of speech and language in humans. That's pretty cool. The study includes some really helpful graphics. I assume because the whole thing is based on a citizen science initiative, and so they probably wrote this study to be helpful to the general public, which is Awesome. So check out this graphic, which shows eight major behavioral propensities that they grouped all the behaviors into, and whether they're affected by genetics, whether they correspond to breed, whether there's a significant difference between breeds and other factors, all of which are shown relative to one physical trait, the size of the dog. That's the bottom line of dots. That's your control. As you can see, human sociability is very tied to genetics. That's a big dot. And agonistic threshold really isn't at all. That's the tiniest possible dot. And under does breed matter, you can see that no trait gets a bigger dot than 25% of the control. Why doesn't breed have more impact on behaviors? Well, the researchers point out several possible factors. First of all, dogs have evolved alongside humans for thousands and thousands of years, while the modern breeds that we have today have only been selected for a tiny blip of that, you know, a few hundred years tops. Not necessarily long enough to really dial in behaviors. Second, with the exception of carefully bred working dogs, most breeds that live in our home as pets today aren't bred for behavior. They're bred for aesthetics. It's the same reason why this apple looks delicious, it's even called delicious, and yet it tastes like fucking trash. It's a trash apple and I would rather eat a raw potato. Because the red delicious apple was selectively bred to be visually appealing to the average supermarket shopper. Brighter reds, more uniform color, bigger fruit, and a thicker skin to allow it to be shipped around the country without too many bruises, all of which came along with a corresponding loss of flavor, making it the worst fucking thing in the produce aisle. Seriously, it's like if if sadness was edible. In the same way, we have golden retriever puppies that have never been more golden, but might not necessarily like the people who have mistakenly chosen to purchase them instead of going to the shelter and getting, frankly, a way better dog at a fraction of the price. And consider that these days, responsible breeders are also concerned with making sure their inbred products don't end up with one of the hundreds of genetic disorders common in purebred dogs, like hip dysplasia or cardiomyopathy. And yes, by the way, the study did confirm that purebred dogs are super inbred, which is not good. The study's conclusions also weren't particularly surprising considering what we know about how genetics affect human behavior. Not a whole lot. Uh, Our genes definitely influence us in many ways, but they aren't simply the program that runs the computer. Why would we expect dogs to be wildly different? All of which brings me back to Bug. 
who you might be able to hear in the background, I'm not sure. Uh, you might call her a pit bull and assume that she has the behaviors that you associate with pit bulls. And now you know, thanks to the study, which behaviors those are more likely to be. It's true that 150 years or so ago, pit bulls were bred to fight bulls and bears. And when that was outlawed, they fought rats and then they fought other dogs. Uh, just like other fighting dog breeds like bulldogs, Akita Inus, and Sharpays. But they weren't simply bred to be mean. At the time, the ideal pit bull's behaviors were tenacity. They didn't want their dog to give up in a fight. And most importantly, an incredibly strong resistance to hurting a human. They wanted a good bond with humans. Because when the dogs were fighting, humans would be in the ring with them. If a dog gets all hyped up in a fight and then turns on the ref, that's the fastest way to lose a fight. Permanently, in fact. A dog that bit a person would likely get the old yeller treatment. So pit bulls were selected in part for the ability to fight other animals, but not humans, to form a strong bond with humans. When we look at the heritability of behaviors from this study, we see that the strongest genetic factor by far is human sociability. Agonistic threshold, which again is how easily a dog can be provoked, is at zero. So from what we know about how pit bulls were bred and from what this study shows us, we could expect that if you took the average pit bull bred in 1854, any genetic influence it had would mostly just cause the dog to be very affectionate and gentle with humans, which is probably why in the mid 20th century, they had a reputation for being nanny dogs for children. And I don't know about you, but I'm not even adopting pit bulls specifically bred to fight dogs or bears or bulls in 1854. I'm just fostering this little velvet hippo who landed in a packed shelter in the year of our Lord 2022. There's been a lot of breeding and crossbreeding and accidents since then. And so as I pointed out earlier, pit bull isn't even really a standardized breed. In fact, here are six of the dogs whose DNA was sequenced for this study. Uh, which one is the American pit bull terrier? I'll give you a few seconds to make your guess. The researchers in the study also had people guess which one was the pit bull, and here are the percentage of people who guessed pit bull for each dog. However, all six of these dogs have almost exactly the same amount of genetic ancestry detected from American pit bull terriers, 25 to 30%. In fact, American Pit Bull Terrier was the most common breed found in this study's mutts at nearly 10%, with the next closest being Lab Retrievers at 6%. This is a self-selected group of dog owners, of course, uh, so it doesn't necessarily translate to the real world. But if 10% of the mutts out there in the world are walking around with a significant portion of Pit Bull genetics, I mean, you might want to rethink your stereotypes. So why do pit bulls seem to dominate our bite statistics? Well, based on this study and others that I've read, um, I have a few ideas. For a start, people tend to call any dog a pit bull if it looks a certain way, regardless of if it is even in that collection of breeds that the term tends to encompass. Even shelter staff and veterinarians do this, according to this study from 2015 that found that out of 62 dogs identified by staff as pit bulls, genetic tests showed only 25 were pit bulls. In 2018, another study showed that among dogs that do have pit bull genes, the majority had less than 50% of those genes. So if pit bulls are commonly over-identified in general, would it surprise you if they're also over-identified when a dog behaves in an aggressive manner? Wouldn't surprise me, to be honest. And if many of these dogs don't even have a pure pit bull DNA, isn't it much more possible that many of these dogs are biting because they're one of the most mistreated types of dog in the Western world, bred and abused and thrown in shelters and put down at rates far worse than any other kind of dog? Does that mean I think that pit bulls are no more dangerous than any other breed? Absolutely not. Look, 
Pitbulls and all of the other dogs who are mistaken for pitbulls have traits that make them more likely to cause damage when something goes wrong. Dogs are dogs, and sometimes things happen. They panic, they play too hard, they lash out due to mistreatment. And when that happens in an eight-pound chihuahua, it might not be that big of a deal. But when it happens with a dog that weighs 50 pounds might be a bigger deal. And when it happens with a dog with particularly muscular jaws, might be a very big deal. Every dog should be raised with love and boundaries and effective training, but it's especially important for dogs that can cause more damage than others. That's why I'm not just providing Bug with a place to live for a few weeks, but I'm also trying to teach her how to be a polite member of society. She doesn't know it, but she's got a lot of human hatred to overcome if she's going to live a good life. 